Welcome to the Real Estate Debate, where we debate the hottest topics in San Diego real estate. Let's meet today's panelists. Guest number one, Steve Pletz, Realtor at Century 21. Yes, it sometimes it does make sense to pay over the appraised value. The, the appraisal is simply an opinion, and sometimes the opinion that comes from the appraiser isn't accurate for market value. Guest number two, Elizabeth Story, owner for Story Estates. I think it's best to sell when it's right for you and your particular home. And real estate is cyclical to a degree, but there is no right or wrong time to sell if it's right for you and for your life and you have a good agent to do it for you. Guest number three, Dan Heilbrunn, broker for Harcourt's Esquire. Uh, you only need one buyer. You need one seller, one buyer. Typically those seasons have a great demand. So, you know, I say either or. There's no bright line rule. And guest number four, AJ Powers, broker owner for Powers Premier. I definitely think there are times where you should pay above appraised value on a home. If uh, the market's increasing and there's a time where you can get in, even if it's a little bit over the appraised value, you're going to start building equity sooner than later and you're going to miss out on a property that's appreciating. All right, welcome to the Real Estate Debate. Thank you all for being here. Really appreciate your time. This is everyone's first time on the Real Estate Debate for TV, right? That's correct. That's right? Correct for me. Now, well, yeah. <laughs> Elizabeth has a little bit of experience with the old real estate debate on radio where she is the champ of all time. So not that you guys should be intimidated. We don't, we don't crown anyone anymore because she was just beating everybody and it got old for everyone, <laughs> including her. So uh, now we have a much more chill atmosphere for our real estate debate. Of course, today we're debating the hottest topics in San Diego real estate. One is about buying, one is about selling. Let's jump right into the action topic number one. I've actually heard people, home sellers, say this or something to this extent. Um, if you're trying to sell a home for top dollar, it's best to list in the springtime, take advantage of the hot summer season. After that, things slow down and sellers don't have as much luck. We're talking about timing the market. Do you agree with that statement or do you disagree, Steve Pletz? No, I disagree with that statement. And I'll tell you why. It, it depends on the type of house. Um, some houses, yes, it's important that the demographic as to who's going to buy that house is going to be a family. So therefore, it's important to them that they purchase during the summer season when the kids are out of school. However, there are a lot of other demographics of buyers and investors and clients that are relocating. I, I, I think it's a terrible idea in order to wait. I mean, th certainly there are, there are pros and cons to all issues, but in San Diego, because of the weather and because of the ability that buyers can relocate and Qualcomm and the Navy and everybody's bringing in people at all times of years, all time of the year, if, if you go on the market in the wintertime, you're going to be just as competitive as during the summer. Okay. All right. Yeah. Um, for the most part, I agree with you. Um, you know, you look at buyer behavior and you think about in the summertime or spring and summertime, you have a longer time to look at a house. Uh, the sun is out longer. Uh, people are out for summer program, you know, their summer program. Um, there's a lot of buyers that, that flood the market, but at the same time, you know, if, if it was canon that everybody would sell a house, at, you know, between May 1st and May 15th, then it would flood the market with inventory, and obviously that would be a terrible time to do it as well. Um, in my experience, summer has been a good time to, to sell. Uh, right now, I feel it's slowing down, um, but I think it's going to pick it up before the winter time. And winter time uh, necessarily is not necessarily a great time to do it because people are thinking about Christmas and, and Thanksgiving. So for the most part, San Diego is gonna wide open summer season, which is a great time to sell. But like, again, like you said, it's not canon. It's not, you know, it's, it's an idea. It's, an, it's uh, what, what people like to come to a conclusion. But again, San Diego is gonna wide open selling season. Okay. AJ? Um, I also disagree to an extent. Right now, our inventory is extremely low and real estate is supply and demand. So if you're looking historically, like last year, we had about 8,000 sales first quarter, 10 or 11 second, 10 or 11 third, and then the fourth was about eight or nine. <coughs> but the new listings to sales was about equal. So we're having the same amount of properties coming on the market as selling. So to me, the demand is there, the rates are great, you have plenty of incentive. Plus, I think we're getting to a point where we're gonna start plateauing in prices. So <coughs> Don't wait till next spring. Do it now because you know the numbers are good. And if there's less people on the market, that means you have uh, an asset that's going to be more of a demand as opposed to being out there with 10 or, or 11,000 active listings. You're going to be one of 7,000. So there's pros and cons to it, but I think don't wait. Okay. Elizabeth? 
I disagree 100%. Um, uh, <laughs> sure. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah, it's just poppycock to scare people into listening at a certain time, and it's not true. And I'll give you a very specific example. Um, I hold the highest price per square foot in Treo, and I listed it in December, and we closed in January with three holidays. So every property is different, every buyer is different, kind of like he said. You know, a high rise doesn't sell to the same client or during the same time as a house right next to the elementary school. Maybe it was a buyer just like mine who was coming from overseas and they just wanted to come during the winter because the winter weather is better in San Diego. Mm. So if you want to sell, it really just comes down to a personal decision about what's best for you at that time. People did get divorced, they change jobs, they move, they get transferred. And Trail is, that's a high rise in downtown. Correct. That you listed in December, yeah. sold in January. Um, is it, did anyone look up where the highest average what month has the highest average price per square foot in San Diego County? No, I can we guess because <laughs> you know, right? I take I, was, a, I believe it's July. I think it's July. Yeah, okay. I was looking at some of the numbers today, and I think it's pretty close to July. Yeah, it's later in the year. Um, September. I, yeah, it's September or October. I can't remember yeah. one of the two, but it, which kind of makes sense because that's when these things are closing, and they're probably getting into escrow. You know, late summer. Um, things like that, but in some areas, yeah. look up look up some zip codes. This is a really interesting stat to show your sellers. Look up some zip codes, and a lot of them that we've looked up, it's October, it's November sometimes mm -hmm. where the highest price per square foot is. Yeah. And that is a result of, I think, just lack of inventory, you know, because a lot of those home sellers also come off the market, um, it, you know, in the summertime if they don't sell their home or if they just can't get it together quick enough, they decide they're going to stay one more year, whatever it may be. So there's less inventory. And that can drive, in some areas, higher price per square foot. So. I actually agree with all of you all and completely disagree with this, which is a common understanding out there in the marketplace for home sellers that you want to sell in the summer, you want to sell in the summer, you want to sell in the summer. And while there's more transactions taking place, there's more volume, you're not necessarily getting the most money for your property. Right. So Especially it, in San Diego, because yes. we don't have snow. So right. we're, we're not shoveling any driveways when we're selling in December. Right. So. Can you imagine if that were the case? I would not be doing these real poor estate. Agents, <laughs> these poor agents in like Michigan and yeah, <laughs> Iowa. Hold on, I got this. <laughs> yeah, that's, why, that's why you do loans. <laughs> it's already it's hard enough office. to find a lockbox yeah. now. So. <laughs> <laughs> All right, let's jump into topic number two. This is for buyers. Uh, this one has come up a lot in recent times. And I know, Dan, you mentioned earlier things had slowed down recently uh, a little bit. We've seen you know homes staying on the market a little bit longer, still really, really much a seller's market, but slowing down as, as in homes aren't selling in a week, they're selling in a month. Um, topic two, agree or disagree, Elizabeth, we'll start with you. As a buyer, you should never pay above appraised value for a home, even if it's your dream home, because that is a recipe for long-term disaster. I disagree, and I will give you three specific examples. I sold a property on Highland Drive in Carlsbad. It was under contract for $1,075,000 and we had two backup offers. The appraisal came back at nine seventy-five. dollars We were in an inclining market. The most important thing I have to say about paying for over appraised value is inclining market. If you're in an inclining market and you know how competitive it is, you might have looked at 30 homes to find your dream home and if you pass up on it, it might be another six to nine months before you find another dream home. Meanwhile, all the prices are going up. So you need to make a decision right then and there if you're in an inclining market and it's just a small difference in appraised price, you could actually be making financial gain by paying over. Again, that property was under contract for $1,075,000, it appraised for nine seventy five dollars today, it's worth $1.6 million. It was not a bad financial decision for that buyer to come up with the difference. I'll give you a second example in Encinitas. I had these clients who were looking, 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 they really couldn't afford much. They finally found a property they could afford, it didn't appraise by $15,000. They let it go, today it's worth 50000 more than what they let it go for. So again, it's always super, super subjective, it's super personal. In a declining market, I would never even consider paying more than appraised value, but in an inclining market, it's definitely something that you might want to consider doing if it's the right property Take and, a look at it. and if you're going to be in it for a long time. Because it also matters how long you're going to be in the home. Yeah, totally agree there. AJ, what do you think about that? Um, I agree with a, a lot of what you said, but do disagree with in the declining, never paying over. There's many times where an appraiser who is a third party comes in with a difference in value because they don't necessarily understand the market, whether it be a local area or what's going on. They're not selling homes. They're just going out and looking at numbers. So they may not understand this is a really limited asset. I'll give you an example. Um, I have clients that are in contract on a property that's new construction in Spring Valley. Very, very little new construction in Spring Valley. So we had one other comp that's in contract that hasn't closed but it appraised for 40,000 over what we're in contract for. Our appraisal came in at 40,000 under ours. 
So they don't necessarily see what we're seeing. So when I went through, we was VA, luckily we did a Tidewater. So I showed them, I pulled the whole zip code. There was one other active, it was 100,000 more. If you want this type of inventory, I'm sorry, this type of home, it doesn't exist. So we have to pay a little bit extra, you know, maybe in the appraiser's eyes to get that asset because there isn't anything like it. Um, another example would be actually the clients that are purchasing that home. They bought a home for 400,000 in 2013. It appraised at 390 and we paid 10,000 over. This was like one of the hottest times in the market too where every single property had <coughs> five or six offers. So they ended up paying 10,000 over for the appraised value. Well, we're in contract today at 495 and they didn't put a single dollar in that home. So in three years, it appreciated 25%, even though they only put $10,000 over, it was, a, it was a smart investment and it made sense at the time. So I think it depends on what you're looking at. Timing definitely makes sense and I agree how long you're staying there. I mean, if rates are really, really good today, pay a little bit more because if you wait six months and it goes up half a percent, even if the price goes down, you're going to be stuck in that higher interest rate and payments probably going to be a little bit higher even if you get it at a better price. Okay. Yeah, definitely something to look at the math on what that might look like. Dan, what do you think? Yeah, and speaking of the math, so I, I, I love your answers are great. Um, you know, you never want to speak in absolute saying never and never is never a good idea. <laughs> it's always, it depends. I mean, one of the reasons why you don't want to do this and why you don't want to pay more than your appraised value is because it can affect your financing because you might not have to spend that much money to, or you, you have to spend more money to buy a, a house over appraised value. It might affect your down payment. Um, so it depends on that person's financial situation. And what you guys are saying is absolutely correct, especially in, a, in an inclining market. Uh, if that's what it takes to get that property, you got to get in it. Uh, you know, I bought a property for, or helped somebody buy a property in 2012 and they sold it in 2014 for $200,000 more. Would it be worth it for them to have paid $5,000 more? Absolutely. You know, and uh, sometimes, you know, you find that house that you want, you have to, you know, do what you can to get it. But again, it depends. It depends on the person's financial situation. Everybody's different. But it's also, uh, it's also an interesting thing. Uh, if a house does appraise for, appraise for under what you've offered, uh, then you have an opportunity to negotiate. So it gives you that, you know, because you have an out in your contract, if it doesn't come in an appraised value, you could actually go back to the seller and uh, have this happen. So um, it might be a good idea as far as renegotiation. So, you know, uh, and another thing, what you said uh, that I'd like to reiterate, sometimes the comps just aren't there. Yeah. Sometimes they're not close enough and you have to guess. And with this market right now, sometimes, you know, you could, you'll find a house for 1,700 square feet that is appraising or selling for 450 and something 500 square feet less that has appraised or comes in with comps like 30,000 under. It's just, a, it's an awkward market and you have to go and get what you want. Steve, what do you think? Well, I, a, a realtor is coming to an agreement on something and I love it. Um, I think that to reiterate what they're saying is an appraisal is an educated opinion of value. We have educated opinions of value and buyers will have educated opinions of value. Uh, you do three different appraisals, you'll get three different numbers sometimes. Um, I, I think the, the, the thing to recognize is that um, some value is very tricky and very difficult to put an exact on for a house. What's the value of the 22nd floor versus the 14th floor? What's the value of granite countertops? What's the value of this view? Um, appraisers have algorithms and they work within a confined restrictions of trying to figure out, well, I need three comps and this one has a view, so my algorithm says that the view is worth $10,000. When actu in actuality, a view may be worth a lot more to a specific buyer because residential real estate is bought and sold on emotion. Maybe there's somebody, we represent a buyer, and that buyer, all they want is a freaking view. Maybe we represent Scrooge McDuck and he really wants the giant tomb that he can jump into with it. I mean, all that stuff is really important to people. So I, I'm just saying that to an appraiser who's looking at numbers and trying to figure out and calculate it all, oftentimes it's very difficult. We've all given some examples. I'll give one very simple example. I represented a buyer this year where a property appraised low. Um, they, it appraised so low that we were concerned that the whole deal wasn't going to work out. We tried to renegotiate with the seller. It was far too low. The buyer decided to change lenders and order a new appraisal. Ten days later, we got a new appraisal at a $60,000 difference. These are qualified, licensed appraisers giving their opinion of value, but it's still an opinion. That's so um, I think that in certain cases, it certainly makes sense in order to pay over the, the I mean, depending on numbers. 
I, I, at the same time, I will say, it's important for a buyer to recognize that the easiest way that they can protect themselves, Elizabeth talked about an inclining or a declining market. What are we in now? Sometimes it's hard to tell. Seems like it's an inclining market, but there is always uh, uh, speculation of, well, is, are things turning? Are, are we propped up? Um, the biggest way that you can protect yourself is not paying over the appraised value up front. Okay, yeah, and it's, it's a very good question and a great segue into what I want to discuss next because you're right, it's always an, an inclining market until it isn't anymore. <laughs> um, and when that is, who knows? But that's what I think is kind of on the table right now. I mean, are we seeing a cyclical slowdown at this point in time? It seems like activity slowed a little bit. Um, it's still well within the seller's market you know, range, but this is what it would look like if it were going to go off the deep end. It would start like this, wouldn't it? So a lot of people out there are starting to go, oh, it's getting slow. Oh, I missed my best chance to sell or mm. whatever it may be. Anyone have an opinion on I, current state? I, if it's all right, I'll jump in. Go ahead. I, heard yeah. you, I heard you were jumping ready. I'll be quick. Um, I think you have to look at the economic factors. Previously, we had economic factors that led to a change big short or all the inventory that flooded the market, we need to look at what are the reasons that we would see an influx of inventory? What would be the reasons we would see a change? In my opinion, there's only a couple. One is the election. No matter who gets elected, everybody is going to have kind of a wait and see attitude. It's unfair for me to say everybody, but a lot of the majority of consumers kind of have a, hmm, what's going to change and how am I going to react to this? Let me wait and see what happens. So I think that'll impact some things. Our national debt, still in the trillions. And student loan debt, to me, is the next big thing for the millennials, for people that are coming up through jobs where they have to continually deal with those items. I think that the next presidential candidate is going to have to compete with a lot of those things and figuring out solutions to those. Otherwise, the inventory is far too low. There's, there's not going to be enough inventory that's going to come on the market that's going to make a change. Okay. Take it away. Yeah. Um, buyer behavior, um, you have to look at buyer behavior. And right now, people are going back to school. Uh, like you were saying, house prices could be really high in November. Um, you know, I think we'll, we'll get another flush of activity before the end of the year. Um, but, you, you know, you're right, you have to look at econom economic factors, you have to look at regulatory factors. We still have a, a harshly regulated mortgage um, regulatory system right now that haven't let up on this. Uh, when it comes down to mortgages as well, uh, interest rates could go up, they could go down. We don't know how, how much our economy is actually propped up right now. Um, also, I think you'd look at the behavior of the new builds. Uh, I live in Carlsbad and there are just places ready to go up. It looks like mm -hmm. ET, you know, where there's, they're riding their bikes to the neighborhoods and there's just a neighborhood after neighborhood coming up that, you know, it's happening in Lacadia, it's happening in Carlsbad, it's happening in Oceanside. Um, so that would help out the inventory. Um, so it's kind of a wait and see attitude and you don't, you know, you don't really know what's going to happen after the election. People will start changing their minds about things. The feds might change their mind about interest rates. Um, so it's a wait and see attitude. Uh, obviously, um, we have seen a, a lot of appreciation in the past four years. So we do have to be trepidatious of whether or not this is going to continue. So okay. we'll wait and see. Wait and see. AJ, what do you think? Um, I don't think we're at the end, but I think we're getting close as far as appreciation, seeing some kind of shift. I think if you're looking at numbers, we're going to sell less homes if we stay on track this year than any year the last four years. Even though the values are higher, we're still seeing less inventory and less sales. Um, but you're still seeing our days on market is shorter than any of the four years averaged out. And I think as long as rates stay under 5%, we're going to see people continuing to buy. Whether or not we see more inventory or we see a shift in how long it's taking to sell them, who knows? But I think it comes down to affordability, which I think we're almost capped out where anyone that makes less than $100,000 can't buy a home at this point. So at what point can we get higher and higher and higher and still have enough demand that those, those homes are going to sell for what they're selling for now or even more? So I think rates, I definitely agree election, but I don't think it's going to be as big of a deal as we're thinking it's going to be. Um, so rates, I think number one, that's going to drive the market more than anything else. Okay. If we get up into the five or six percent, which is still historically great, but people are going to get scared away, and it's going to change what they can afford, and obviously that's going to change how much homes are selling for. Elizabeth, I know you have an opinion on this. Yes, I have an opinion on everything. Tell me. Um, yeah, you know, it's kind of a summary of what they said, and I want to kind of tie it up with a little cross-referencing points. A um, couple things that I want to make sure I talk about: hyper local 
we're in San Diego, it's hyper-local, we're near the water, they don't build more water, so we're always going to have a higher demand in San Diego than some other parts of the country. And also hyper-local. He brought up Carlsbad, for example. Carlsbad, old Carlsbad, 92008, specifically, in 2011 when it was about the bottom of the dip, they rebounded faster than almost any other zip in the county of San Diego. Well, last year, they started taking a little dive. Uh, property started sitting on the market a little bit longer and they started having a lot of trouble because of all that new construction that you're talking about. So not that specific market is going to be independent of other economic factors because it's an inventory, it's a mm. supply, it's a demand issue. But going back to what I've been seeing ever since that you know 2011 kind of bottomed me out is those lending reg regulations that did change. It's good for all of us because people who are buying properties are well qualified. They have skin in the game. I'm still seeing cash buyers, large down payments. People who put a large down payment into their home, people who buy it for cash, they're going to hold on to it. The, the crash that happened, this last crash, we have to remember why it happened. It happened because of bad lending. People who had no skin in the game and a lot of people who are walking away from nothing anyway. They were walking away from bad debt they should, never should have been in. So as long as we keep seeing these stable buy buyers, these qualified buyers, I'm hoping that we'll have neighborhood stability. That being said, I do expect, you know, in the next year to start seeing a little more plateauing because the fact of the matter is we just can't keep up with this pace. You have to be, you, you do, you have to be a six-figure earner to be able to afford a home in San Diego. And at some point, that's going to have to level out. Yeah. I'm, all, I'm also kind of curious to see what water, wildfire, and infrastructure is going to do because people are moving here. Uh, something like 70,000 college degrees moved to San Diego just last year. Uh, money is moving out of San Francisco because it's too expensive up there. It's ex expensive in LA. Um, so I'm seeing a massive population spike here. So, you know, uh, but I, when you're talking about microclimates, I always think about that. What's the price of a house that's going to be near a wildfire? Do we have the water to put it out? Do we have the water to remain the infrastructure here? And then I drive to Kearney Mesa every day. So I go down to five. How you know, I, we need to widen that road. Mm -hmm. If we keep on building, what's going to happen in the traffic? Exactly. Traffic's going to get worse. It's going to be like LA. Great it's stuff, though. Thank you all. I think it's, it's on its way. It's on its way. Thank you guys so much. Great insight today. Really appreciate your time. Thank you. Tune in next month, same time, same channel, for more Real Estate Debate, where we debate the hottest topics in San Diego real estate and guarantee to make you smarter than everyone else. We'll see you then. Thank <laughs> you.